Multitask. I'm not very good at multitasking, so I've been told. So I'm guessing that must be that one. So um, this leaves us for our final lecture. So our final lecture is going to be for um, Caroline Cupid, and you're going to ask us a question that I suspect um, that some of us are thinking, mm, right, do I, do I really need to take my statin, I'm guessing? So uh, I'm just thinking that maybe we should answer that at the end. So please. I may not answer it at all. <laughs> okay, so the title of my talk is Do I Really Need to Take a Statin? And I'm going to look behind the scenes at influences on GP's advice about cardiovascular disease prevention. Um, and before I start, I'd like to thank the Health Foundation for funding this work and also for my, uh, to my supervisors for their excellent mentorship. Um, and for nominating me for the PhD award and the Doctoral College for inviting me to speak. Um, I'd also like to just acknowledge the very, very many people, particularly in Sapphire and friends and family that have supported this and some of whom are here today. Um, so I really, really do appreciate that support through this. So this quote is perhaps a funny place to begin. It's from a 17th century sermon. Um, but it illustrates the intuitive common sense of preventing disease in order to avoid the very real consequences. Um, and it makes, this idea is that it makes sense to invest some effort up front in order to reduce problems in the future. So in the case of cardiovascular disease, we all know the huge disability that can occur as a result of having a heart attack or a stroke. And it makes sense as individuals and also as a society to do what we can to minimise the chances of these types of event. So this slide, um, this next slide, illustrates um, the risk factors that are widely acknowledged to be associated with the development of cardiovascular disease. Um, so factors such as poor diet, uh, low exercise, and also the risk conditions like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and so on. And um, national policymakers have been really keen to promote interventions in general practice that are designed um, to address these factors. However, I began this study because I discovered that within the GP community, there were really some considerable concerns that preventative interventions might actually be doing more harm than good for patients. So this word cloud that you can see on the screen um, is from a GP discussion forum, and it highlights some of the concerns that were being expressed. And GPs were worried that um, new risk conditions like pre-diabetes or the lowering of disease thresholds, for instance, for hypertension, um, and also risk calculators, which are often used as the basis for prescribing statins, um, were creating kind of unnecessary medicalization. And this group of GPs were concerned that 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 the kind of scale of the benefit from preventative drugs was actually potentially quite small for the individual, and that with the side effects and other consequences, it might actually, they might actually weigh, outweigh the benefits for some people. So this discussion was going on in the context of considerable public debate about the research evidence on statins, and that's a debate which many of you will know is still ongoing now. So my study was not to determine the clinical benefits or the harms of preventative interventions. So I'm sorry to disappoint you if that's what you come for. Um, but to understand more about what was actually happening in real life practice and um, what was bringing about the concerns that I've mentioned in the GP community in particular. And to do that, I observed consultations in general practice, particularly health check appointments, and I talked to patients about their own experiences of preventative care. I also went behind the scenes, so to talk to people involved in the commissioning of local healthcare services and to GPs and other professionals delivering those services. And what I found was that patients who are targeted with preventative interventions are often looking for really broad support to improve their health and have all kinds of issues that might make it quite difficult to do that. 
However, the support provided is really quite inhibited by the influence of performance metrics and other structural issues that affect clinical practice. And I'm going to just spend the rest of the time now just unpacking that a little bit more for you. So, for example, when I talked to uh, patients, they often described how they struggled to achieve meaningful conversations. That was a term that came up quite a few times uh, with healthcare professionals about how to best address their health needs. And the excerpt I'm just about to put up on the screen um, is from a conversation with a patient I called Dan. So Dan is a 60-something-year-old um, ex-lorry driver, and he talked about how he had radically lost weight He'd started doing exercise, and he'd also um, done quite a bit of online research into the medications he was taking. However, when he tried to have a conversation with his GP about coming off these medications, because he thought they were maybe causing him some problems, um, Dan says this. He says, the GP got very vociferous, and there was no meaningful conversation. It was, you will, you must. And then he talks about um, how he interacts with healthcare professionals now. He says, I always feel under pressure um, because they look at my notes uh, and they say, you should have been on those tablets. To put it bluntly, I think that doctors think they have the right to insist that they're right. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, and I really enjoyed my conversation with Dan. <laughs> it was a great conversation. Um, and of course, this is just one example um, with one patient and one uh, GP. And not everybody had the same experience, but it was noticeable that when patients talked with healthcare professionals about their risk and how it should be managed, that they were struggling to get conversations that were specific to them. So when making a decision about statins, for instance, patients will be looking for support with making sense of the research evidence, perhaps, but also with working out whether for them, as an individual, in their particular situation, the potential benefits are actually worth it, and how statins might relate to other ways of improving their health, for instance. They're not usually hoping for just a standardised blanket information about lifestyle or about medications. And these kind of individualised conversations are what Anne-Marie Moll, the philosopher, uh, calls shared doctoring. And I think this is quite just a helpful way of summarising so it's the kind of care that gets worked out between the healthcare professional and the patient together, that recognises that the starting point for a particular patient may often be quite a complex mix of health issues and all kinds of other stuff of everyday life. It's the kind of care that tries things out, like a statin medication, but then is prepared to adjust and adapt. And it's the kind of care in which the healthcare professional doesn't try and control the patient, but they are able to input their expertise into that decision. So my conversations with doctors and practice nurses often tied in with uh, what patients had reported, although they maybe didn't characterise it in the same way. Um, so healthcare professionals spoke of the difficulties of finding time for meaningful conversations within the pressurised environment of general practice. And this quote illustrates that. And that means it's easier for them to prescribe a statin medication, for example, rather than helping someone to reduce their risk of disease in other ways, like changing their diet. And some healthcare professionals, therefore, felt that they were pressured towards pushing people onto medications. And in March's edition of the British Journal of General Practice, which will come out later this week, um, there's a short article that I put together with one of my GP participants about the stress of feeling pulled between delivering good patient care but also hitting performance targets and the kind of very visceral experience of, of tension that that creates. The title of this slide is also from an interview with a GP and I've put it up here because the importance of recording decisions about statins and other medications um, came out quite strongly in my interviews uh, with professionals. And in particular, they talked about the need to record it on the notes if the patient declined treatment. Now, at one level, this is hardly worth 
commenting on, really. But at another, we can see it as a little bit of a clue um, into what's going on behind the scenes. So recording a decision about statins on the notes isn't just to help the GP manage the, the patient's health care better. Recording that decision feeds into all kinds of systems through which the performance of the practice is monitored and rewarded. So both the income and the reputation of a GP practice can be significantly affected um, by their um, performance in relation to the diagnosis and treatment of risk conditions with medications. And at a grander scale, GP records also allow managers and policymakers to calculate key statistics such as the number of lives and the costs that will be saved uh, through putting people on medications, at least in theory. Now, I don't have time to talk in detail um, about all the different measures and the calculations involved, but I do want to emphasise that they represent a, a, a really limited way of knowing about an individual patient and also what good care for that individual patient might actually look like. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with measurement or even having incentives in place. Um, However, what my study was highlighting was that in the current context of general practice, with all the resource pressures that are affecting GPs' work, these measures and incentives have become really dominant, and they do reorganise the work of GPs and others um, in ways that actually inhibit the kind of collaborative care that patients often need whether that be to come to a decision about statins specifically or to make some of the really significant lifestyle changes that may be important for their underlying health. So lastly, I just want to share a finding from the study that's geared more towards the healthcare professionals in the room. Um, there's a lot of talk about the importance of shared decision-making or patient-centred care in healthcare. Um, but I found that these concepts are really quite slippery. So this slide um, highlights, well, what I'm going to show you in a minute, highlights that it's very easy for clinicians to adopt the idea of shared decision-making, when even by their own accounts, um, the interactions may not be likely to feel collaborative to patients. So this excerpt here is um, from an interview with a really lovely, competent practice nurse talking about sharing decisions about uh, statins with patients. So she says you've got the barriers to start breaking down. It's what do you know about statins? What have you heard? What would you feel about taking them? And then you explain to them what the side effects are. If they have the side effects, then let me know because I'll stop the tablets. It, you know, it's up to them. They don't have to take them if they don't want to. It's going to reduce their risk, but I can't say for definite it means they won't have problems. It has to be their choice. So what Lydia describes here is an increasingly prominent mode of clinical practice, and what Anne-Marie Moll, who I mentioned earlier, describes as embodying a logic of choice as opposed to a logic of care. So you'll note that Lydia describes how she does offer this choice, and she doesn't force anybody to do anything, but what she also does is to kind of superimpose um, a standardised ideas about how to treat uh, this patient over those individual concerns of the patient. Um, she corrects them as they bring misunderstandings about statins to the discussion. Um, and importantly, I mean, she, she was a really, really good practice nurse. This wasn't somebody that was a, a bad case at all. Um, but she sees what she describes here as representing an ideal model of shared decision-making. But what I'd argue is that unless the patient is very determined or is able to bring some considerable expertise to this conversation, it's really uh, going to be difficult for them not to choose to accept statin, um, whatever you know, their individual priorities or their concerns or uncertainties about doing so. And I'd argue that this approach that we see here is organised to happen as a result of the various performance measures and other institutional factors that shape how um, healthcare professionals are conducting these types of consultation. So just some final thoughts um, about how this study uh, can contribute to improving patient care. 
So just first, it contributes to a conversation about what is important. Is good care that healthcare professionals simply promote technical solutions, such as a statin technology or another approach? Or do we also need to value the time and the skill required to make these technologies meaningful to individual patients within the context of clinical practice? And that seems to me to be very relevant in preventative care, where there are uh, many different ways of um, going about prevention that include both medications and also the real challenges of lifestyle change that are rooted in the stuff of everyday life. And for anybody that's interested, um, I've put up this web link to the Rethinking Medicine website, which aims to promote this kind of discussion. And second, the study highlights that we can't just focus on GP communication skills in order to improve care practices. So, in fact, healthcare professionals are often really frustrated themselves about the ways in which their ability to care is constrained. So instead, we do, I think, need to look at an institutional level in order to make improvements. Um, and that may sometimes mean prioritising slightly different goals to those that are embedded in the processes of performance measurement. So that's me done. Thank you very much. And I appreciate I've only given you a flavour of this, but happy to answer questions afterwards as well. Yeah, so I mean, I wasn't able to really look at um, patient compliance, and in a sense, that wasn't the main issue. But there are obvious implications for this, that if somebody goes away from a consultation not having felt that they've um, engaged with um, the medical professional, I would argue that compliance is likely to be lower. Um, but there's a danger in just assuming that everybody should be complying with a particular regime because actually the whole point of this study was to look from the patient angle and say, well, actually, you know, a statin might be recommended for somebody with a risk calculation of X percent, but actually that person, it might not be top of their priorities to be taking that medication. And I do think that that's a, a valid way of looking at it from the patient perspective. <coughs> Um, I think it kind of underlay the conversations that we had. So the study was not specifically looking at the media side of it. Um, but everything that people know about a topic comes from somewhere. And people know a lot, <laughs> in inverted commas, about statins or other preventative medications. So that's not always through the kind of official channels. Um, so, yeah, that, I, I mean... I don't know, I think that answers your question properly, but, but yes, it kind of underlies it. But I'd be really interested to talk to you about that. And then, last one for you. So, Tom. Yes, so again, a really nice talk. So, just, it's just topical today, I presume, where um, we see that um, life expectancy in a so called civilised society is actually reducing, mm. um, particularly for our most disadvantaged. Mm. And if you look at the key conditions that um, give that difference in life expectancy, a lot of them are potentially. <coughs> like lung cancer through smoking, hypertension, mm. uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, dementia. Mm. So, so I presume just if you were um, the Chief Medical Officer or the Health Secretary, <laughs> um, what would be your advice to them as to how to encourage people to engage with effective prevention 
given that, if, in essence, if, if those most disadvantaged and comply with lifestyle change, dietary change, etc., they're probably spending eighty percent of their salary on those interventions. Mm. So it's not going to happen. Yeah, and that is the issue, isn't it? So the, the, the slide that I put up near the beginning shows this kind of idea of behavioural factors, but also the social and environmental factors. And actually, anybody that works in practice knows that actually those social and environmental factors influence what you can really do in everyday life. Um, so I, I wouldn't dare to say what I would do if I was in charge, but you, you must address those things. And that's what things like the Marmot Review um, have called for the way along. Um, but I guess there is also the role of clinical professionals to help people and support them in what they can do. Um, yeah. Ian, the last word. Yeah, fine. I, I think I should just um, say that the question I want to pose you is the one that's been discussed endlessly by heads of medical schools for the last three decades that I know of. And that is, you know, in terms of difficulty people have with communication consultation skills, be they doctors or nurses or other. Are we selecting the right people the right way? <laughs> <laughs> There's a question, and again, probably beyond my competency level to answer it. But it is, you know, my, my campaign through this work would be to say, actually, these kind of consultation skills and recognising the importance of a really collaborative care system has to be, I think, a really top priority, whether it be preventative care or other forms of care. Um, and quite what that means for the selection of students, um, I'll leave to other people in medical education, <laughs> she says, diving out of this quite quickly. <laughs> um, but I do, in all seriousness, think that that's a really, just, really good issue. One of the suggestions of the one time was that we should introduce psychometric testing for all health professionals and medical students, but then when they heads and over and looked around themselves, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. But I think I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you from that because you might say something. I'm going to say. Can I present you with um, an illuminated certificate? I think wow. we call it. Wow. And can we get a shameless photograph? Thank you very much. Three really interesting and very, very different um, lectures. And